Video three of chapter seven. Now we're gonna start getting into actually doing some sampling distribution problems. According to census data, about 11% of Americans are teens. The proportion P hat of teens in a simple random sample of 1500 Americans should therefore be close to 11%. If a national sample contains only 9.2% of teens, should we suspect that the sampling procedure is somehow underrepresenting teens and or the teen population has declined since the last census? What is the probability of such an event occurring? Now, since we do not know the truth about the population, I don't have all of the census data about uh, ages of Americans. And then, you know, what ages are they considering uh, Americans to be teens? You know, is it 13 to 18? I would believe it's 13 to 18. So I have no idea anything about what the census data looks like here. Okay. So since we don't know the truth about the population or what its shape center spread looks like, then we must rely on the sampling distribution. Now, Specifically, we're going to talk about, in the beginning of this chapter, uh, the sampling distribution of sample proportions. We are asking a proportion question. Later this chapter, we will start to explore uh, sampling distributions of sample means. Now, what does a sampling distribution of sample proportions look like? What are its shape, center, and spread? So first, for shape, the sampling distribution for a sample proportion, p hat, will be approximately normal if the following condition is met. If n times p is greater than or equal to 10, and if n times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. Now, n is our sample size, and p is the population proportion. And that was one of the numbers that had to be given to us uh, in the problem itself. So the main question that comes up is what happens if one or both of these conditions fail? What if I multiply these two values and I don't get a number that's bigger than 10? Or what if I multiply these values together and I don't get a number that's at least 10? Well, then that means our sampling distribution for the sample proportions is not approximately normal. And therefore, it would have to be either skewed left or skewed right. The main thing you need to know is if this condition fails, and it doesn't have to be both of these fails, but if one or both of them fail, it just means that our sampling distribution is not approximately normal. That's the main thing you need to remember, that it's just not normal. So what does it look like if it's not normal? It's skewed in one of the two directions. It just depends on what the value of P is for the most part to know if it's skewed left or skewed right. So let's see what the shape is going to look like for our problem. So we have to check the n times P and n times 1 minus P. Are they both greater than or equal to 10? Uh, and if so, again, we get to say that our sampling distribution will be approximately normal. Now, the tricky part comes into play for what P represents. The N is typically the easier part. What is the sample size? Well, the sample size is 1,500 Americans. So for N, we know we're going to plug in 1,500. And then what is P? Because, man, there's two numbers up here, two percentages. So which one is P? Well, for right now, P is the population proportion. It is our parameter value. So we need to identify which percentage up here really relates to the entire population and not referencing the sample size. So when it says about 11% of Americans are teens, well, that says according to census data. And census data is about the data from the entire population. So we want to use as P the 11%. Now, what does the 9.2% represent? It says if a sample contains only 9.2% teens, well, then that 9.2% would be P hat. And for right now, we want to use P. We will get to a point later um, this semester 
where instead of P, we won't know what the population proportion is, so we will have to replace it with something else. And then that's where we will get to use P hat. But for now, we're going to start with, do we know the population value? Or do we have an estimate of the population value? And if so, we're going to use it. So we are going to use the 11% for P. And so we're questioning, is 11% of 1,500 greater than or equal to 10? And is the opposite of 11% greater than or equal to 10 times the sample size? So if I were to do the math here, 1,500 of 11% would give us 165. And that is definitely greater than or equal to 10. And if I did the math for the other one, I would get 1,335, which is definitely greater than or equal to 10. Now, a couple things I just want to point out here is, number one, these two numbers that we end up with here, the 165 and the 1335, should add up to be our total sample size. So if you don't want to do both sets of calculations here, and if you feel confident you did the first one correctly, you could just say, well, hey, if this is 165, then what number is this going to be? It would be 1500. It'd be our total sample size but we would need to subtract away what we got from our first number here. And so what's left over is the 1335. And this will always work out. In the end, this really follows more of a binomial distribution uh, because we have either P or we don't have P, right? We have two outcomes. Um, and so the N times P, more than anything, represents our successes. How many successes? would we expect to see out of 1,500 if we were really looking at 11% of Americans or teens? So on average, out of 1,500 uh, Americans, we expect 11% of them to be teens. Well, that would be 165 uh, teens that we would expect to see. And then the N times 1 minus P really represents what we would consider a quote-unquote failure. So we would expect out of 1,500, if they weren't 11% of teens, we would expect 1,335 uh, Americans to not be teens. So in the end, since both of these are greater than or equal to 10, we get to establish that, yes, the sampling distribution is, in fact, approximately normal. Now, what all would you need to show uh, to get full credit on my chapter test and on the AP exam? Um, I would definitely write out what I'm going to be kind of exploring here, this n times p and n times 1 minus p. Um, I would write out what the end values ended up being just to show that, hey, it is true that both my successes and failures are greater than or equal to 10, and mentioning the fact that the sampling distribution is approximately normal. So those are the main three things I would show there. Um, do you have to show the numbers plugged into the formula? Do you have to show any kind of calculations or math? And no, not really. You don't have to do that. Now, the center of our sampling distribution for sample proportions, the mean of all possible sample proportions, mu sub p hat, right? If we took all of these samples and calculated a sample proportion, we would have all of these sample proportions, all of these p hats creating a sampling distribution. And then what we would find out is that the mean of all of these p hats, the center, should be centered right on the true population proportion, which is why the sample proportion is an unbiased estimator of the population proportion. So mu sub p hat, the mean or the center of all of the p hats, of all the sample proportions that we could take, should be approximately the same as the true population proportion. So for our problem, what would that be? Well, that would be our 11% was what the population proportion value was. Again, this isn't the 9.2%, that was the sample proportion, right? That was our sample statistic. That was p hat. Now, last but not least, the spread. The standard deviation of all possible sample proportions, sigma sub p hat, uses the formula, the square root of p times 1 minus p all over the sample size n. Now, this one has some baggage tied to it. 
if the following condition is met. So this is kind of like our shape. We can say the shape is approximately normal if n times p and n times 1 minus p were both greater than or equal to 10. So the condition for the standard deviation is, is the population at least greater than or equal to 10 times the sample size? And you might be wondering, why do we have to have this condition? What if the condition fails? Those are good, valid questions. So first, the why. So the condition only applies when we're sampling without replacement, which is what we're typically going to do. We're not going to select one person, record their um, status if they're a teenager or not a teenager, and then put them back in the population and then sample the next person because we could get the same person twice. So typically, we're not going to sample with replacement. We're typically going to sample without replacement, right? We're going to take one person and then a new person and then a new person. But as we collect more and more people from our population, our pool of candidates that can be next in line for our sample gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So sampling without replacement comes with a certain amount of error associated with it. And that error is at an acceptable level when we sample from less than 10% of our population. So this condition is also referred to as the 10% rule or the 10% condition. I'll come back to here. Because our sample size, if it took 10 times our sample size, it's got to be smaller than the entire population size. So really, this represents less than... 10% of our entire population. Now, what if it fails? What if that condition fails? How are we going to calculate the standard deviation? And the truth is, there is a much more complex formula that we could use for the standard deviation, but we are realistically not going to use that formula in an intro level stats course. If you were to take um, you know, some much more advanced level stats courses, you would probably just use that more complex formula to begin with. Um, but it involves knowing or being able to have a good estimate of what the true population size is, which in some cases you don't really know. So you might have to come up with a good estimate for what that would be. So for our problem, the population is the population, who is the population? <coughs> all Americans, not all teens, we're taking this sample of Americans and determining the proportion of those Americans that are teenagers. So is our population greater than or equal to 10 times our sample size of 1,500? So 10 times 1,500 would be 15,000. Are there more than 15,000 Americans? And that would definitely be a scenario where we would say, assume true. And not really assume true. I would say definitely is true, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So to calculate our standard deviation, I get to use my formula now. And so I plug in 0.11, 11% in for the population proportion. And I divide that P times 1 minus P divided by the sample size of 1,500. Square root that value. And I get a number that is just under technically 1%. It's 0.8% is our standard deviation. So now, what is the sampling distribution of sample proportions socks? Well, it is approximately normal. It's got a mean of about 11%, and it's got a standard deviation of slightly smaller than 1%, a 0.8079%. So now we can finally get to the question that we really asked here. What is the probability of such an event occurring? Well, what was that event that occurred? We took a sample, and we found in our sample only 9.2% of teens. So what is the probability? So let's kind of color code and match things up here. What is the probability, so capital P, of such an event? What was our event? We had a sample proportion that was 9.2. So our sample proportion, our P hat, was 9.2%. 
Now you might be wondering, why did I put less than or equal to? Why didn't I put equal in this scenario? Because that was the event that occurred, that p hat was equal to 9.2%. Well, if you consider we have an approximately normal distribution, which is a continuous distribution. And so the probability of a single value happening in an approximately normal distribution is roughly 0%. So we need to give our approximately normal distribution uh, an area to consider. And since our 9.2% was less than what we expected to happen at 11%, then we're going to consider everything that happens on that left end of the distribution. So if I were to draw a picture of what's happening here, I've got an approximately normal shape. I know the mean in the middle, mu sub p hat, is that 11%. And we saw something that was less than 11%. We saw, here's our p hat of 0 0.092. And again, if I wanted to just do 0 0.092, what is its probability? I'm really finding the area of a segment, which is roughly zero. So if I'm already on the left side of the distribution, to give that 9.2% really any kind of value, I need to figure out what is the probability of that event occurring or other more rare events occurring. So we will get to use normal CDF because we verified that the shape is approximately normal. Our lower bound would be realistically zero or theoretically, we can do negative infinity as our lower bound. Uh, our upper bound is the 9.2%. Our mean, what we expected to see happen, was our 11%. And our standard deviation was the 0 0.008079. And so once we throw that into our normal CDF, we're going to get what is the probability of seeing such an event occur. And that answer is... 1.294%. So normal CDF is going to give us really 0 0.01294. Now, what that number initially represents is saying, assuming that we should see 11% of teens in a sample, then seeing a sample of 1,500 Americans produce only 9.2% or less of teens, should occur about 1.294% of the time. So what exactly does that mean? There were a couple ideas up here in the question that we were exploring. Should we suspect that the sampling procedure is somehow underrepresenting teens? And or has the teen population declined since the last census? So taking those two things into account, what we're really kind of pondering and considering here is, number one, we could have just gotten a sample, a sample of 1,500 Americans that had not so many teens in it, less than what we would have expected. And that could happen. That's just uh, sampling variability at its finest. We're not always going to get 11% of teens in every single sample that we get. Some of them are going to have more teens. Some of them will have less teens. We just happen to get a sample that maybe had less teens. So that's one thing that could have happened here. The other thing that could have happened is maybe the truth about the population is that it's no longer 11% teens. Maybe it's something closer to 9.2%. Maybe the population has declined for teenagers. We don't know. So which of those two scenarios is the truth? We, we just don't know. So what I want you to consider is that Reese's Pieces claim to have 40% orange candies. A random sample of 100 candies is taken. I want you to describe the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. We will discuss this the next day in class.